Welcome to SLP Full Disclosure. I am Michelle, your host, and today we're going to be talking about something that I think all of you know is very near and dear to my heart, which is child development. We're going to be doing a two-part series, and I'm going to do my best to kind of keep it reined in and not get too off topic because I could literally talk for hours on this topic. Um, I think we're going to start with maybe birth to 18 months is what we're going to talk about in this episode and just things that we're looking for as far as activities to do with babies. And I like to call babies little blobs because they don't really do anything, but that language and everything is really developing um, as soon as they're born um, all the way up to 12 months and then 12 to 18 months, some things that we can be doing to promote that language and that development. So. I'm going to talk to you guys today as if um, you were an early intervention family so that you kind of see how I train, do that parent training and that parent coaching um, when I have those uh, early intervention families. Obviously, in that birth to three population, the speech language pathologist is not usually pulled into it until about 12 months. So if those kiddos are receiving services, they're going to be receiving occupational therapy services um, and most likely physical therapy services. Um, so as we talk through the language development, you're going to see that I'm going to kind of intertwine all of those areas of development because, yes, we are speech language pathologists and our primary focus and our primary goal is to develop that communication, develop that language, get those kiddos talking, using words to communicate. But we can't forget about those other areas of development. And I think in one of my first episodes, I talked about as a speech language pathologist, we are trained in child development, language development. We know all of those developmental milestones. We know those norms, but we also, it's also very important that we have a good grasp and a good knowledge of those other areas as well. Because what you're going to see is you're going to be using a lot of motor, you're going to be using a lot of fine motor, you're gonna be using a lot of cognitive skills, you're gonna be using a lot of those things as you're trying to develop those language skills. So um, I mentioned my big girl group from Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and we're just now starting to have babies in that group. So I'm going to probably refer to um, Brooks and Brady a lot because we've got a perfect age group right there for us to talk about. Um, so what do you do with a baby? How do we start developing those skills with an infant? They're not going to, we can't expect them to have words. Are they communicating? What do we do to, to get that ball rolling so that we stay on target and we can get to where we need to be when we get 12 to 18 months? So we know that babies can't see very much. They can see about 12 to maybe 15, 18 inches. They can only see bright colored things. So that's why the baby toys and all of those things that you see are really bright and vibrant colors. Um, lots of movement. They can recognize faces, but they can also recognize sounds. And I saw this, a perfect example of this was when I met Brooks for the first time. And of course, we were all passing him around and we were talking to him and he was like, oh my goodness. And he was just a, a few weeks old, a couple of months old. And as soon as he heard Mackenzie's voice, his eyes started moving and you could tell he recognized her voice. So he might not have been able to see all of our faces and he couldn't make out all of those tiny little things, but that voice he recognized and he immediately started to move differently. His facial expressions changed, his body language changed, everything changed when he heard his mama's voice. So when we've got these babies and we're having to do, you know, these new moms out there, their tummy time, their do this, do that. There are so many things that you're focused on, but how do we promote that language? We're going to talk, talk, talk to our babies. That's what we're going to do. In those early weeks, in those early months, we're going to be talking to them. We're going to use um, our voices. We're going to use sounds. We're going to use music. We're going to use all of those things to engage our child because communication is about engagement. And we have to develop those early prerequisite skills early on so that as we move through those developmental stages and get to those developmental milestones where we should be using words, that we've mastered those skills. Something that 
I really hit hard in my early intervention sessions with my families is that motor imitation piece. And so many times I find that that is the one skill that is most often overlooked. So when we start thinking about it, what do we do with babies? We sing songs. We do pat a cake. We play peekaboo. We're doing all of those things. And we're doing that to teach early on those play skills because play skills are paramount in language development. Okay. So we're going to be singing these songs. We're going to be doing the hand motions that, you know, before I went to school and, you know, everyone is around babies, but before I went to school and I was really trained on language development, I just thought, singing nursery rhymes and singing songs and doing pat a cake and playing peekaboo and doing all those things. I thought it was just something that you do with babies. Like that's just what you do because they can't really do anything else, right? Well, that's not true. The reason we do those things is because those are prerequisite skills that those kids have to have in place before they can learn that language and learn how to use words. Um, I'm going to also go off on a little tangent now about videos and screen time. I mentioned that in one of my previous episodes. It's very easy. I I know there's a lot of access out there now with YouTube and videos and lots of amazing um, programs that are on for kids and for babies with music and those kinds of things. I'm not a huge advocate for putting your kids in front of a screen and giving them access to iPads and watching videos all day long because language develops from interacting with people and engaging with people and interacting with toys and interacting with different things like that, books, learning to play. So what you're going to find is that the primary thing that we're going to talk about today is play and talking to your baby. So we've got this newborn, we're talking to the baby, we're making eye contact, but we're also going to be doing things like Peekaboo. Why do we need to do peekaboo? It teaches that object permanence. You're there one minute, you're gone the next, but then you come back again, right? So doing all of those things to engage that child, to work on that eye contact, we're doing, we're playing music, we're doing things, we're doing cause and effect. All of the little pop-up toys, those things that we have that are um, available to all of the babies. Everybody has pop-up toys and everybody has shape sorters and the ring stackers and all of those things. And they're going to come into play really big when we get into that 12 month, 12 to 18 month range. Um, But with our babies, it's really simple. We're going to talk to them. We're going to read to them. We're going to sing songs and we're going to let them see our facial expressions. We're going to show them toys. We're going to get them, you know, and I told you I was kind of the crazy, you know, hyper-focused mom. And I was doing the things like the tracking and those kinds of things, making sure that they're looking and following and crossing midline, doing all of those things. It seems like it's very simple. And in reality, it is. If you have a new baby at home and you're talking to that baby, you're reading stories to that baby, You're showing that baby bright colored toys. You're moving it in front of them. You're letting them track it. You're letting them see it. You're holding it and you're moving it out of the way. That's what you need to be doing because language is developed through play and through repetition. I've also found with my early intervention families that word repetition, because babies don't really give you a whole lot back, that communication is pretty much through crying, uh, just vocalizations and those kinds of things from that birth to six months before they can really start interacting and reaching for toys and that kind of thing. A lot of times parents are like, well, they're not giving me anything back. So is it really important that I talk to the baby? Yes, it's, it's important. Please talk to your babies, sing songs, do those things. Because once you get to that six month stage, You're getting to the point where the baby is going to be able to start reaching for toys. They're going to be able to hold things. You've got the toys that have the little rings in them, the little holes in them so that they can grasp them with their little hands. And you're going to be working on all of those things. But while you're talking to your baby, what are you saying? You're talking about the ball is round. It's making a noise. I hear the bell. I hear the music. I hear daddy's voice. Where is daddy? 
you're doing all of those things because you're telling them the language. You're giving them the monologue for what goes along with the activity that you're doing. I, I tell my parents in early intervention a lot that as the parent, when you're developing language or that those early language skills, you're basically a sports commentator, right? So birth to six months, you're really just letting the, letting the baby hear your voice, letting the baby hear different sounds and become accustomed. You know, I can't imagine going back to what it would be like to be a baby because when you and I get up every day as adults, I was just telling um, Katie that's on with us now that there's a lawnmower in the background. And I can hear it. And I was making sure she couldn't hear it while we were recording. But when I heard that, I knew what that sound was. It made sense to me. When I hear the microwave beep, I know what that is. When I hear a vacuum, when I hear the toilet flush, I know those sounds. And we have to remember that babies are experiencing this world every day when they wake up. And it's all brand new. The sounds that they hear the music that they hear, the voices that they hear, the things that they smell, the things that they feel, it's all different to them. If I hear, if I, you know, brush across a, a soft blanket, I know what that is. If I brush against something rough or scratchy, I know what that is. And it's all brand new to babies. So we have to tell them the blanket is soft. That's why we have this, the touch and feel books. And that's why we have them. Because babies don't know crinkly, they don't know scratchy, they don't know rough, they don't know soft, they don't know hard, they don't know those things. So why do we have touch and feel books? It's so we can introduce that to them early on, okay? So six to 12 months, we're going to be getting into the fun time. That's when they're going to start exploring. Some babies may be sitting up. They're able to hold toys. You can give them things. And that's where we're, that's when me, I'm going to be the one that's going to be taking that toy and hiding it and putting it under the table or putting it behind me or moving it to the side to see, are they able to remember where it is, that object permanence? Do they know that when I take this toy and put it under the table, are they looking? Or do they just like, oh, well, it's gone. Oh, well. Those are the kinds of things that I'm looking for when I'm looking and when I'm working with a family of a really young baby. And I know that the first thing that parents say to me when I get a new early intervention family is, do you think they have autism? Because that is the biggest fear when we've got late talkers. Something that I will probably get a lot of slack for in the speech community, and that's okay, I can take it, is, you know, People always want to know how many words should a child have at this age? How many words should a child have at that age? I don't like to do numbers. I don't like to say if they have X number of words, they're typical. If they, have, if they don't have X number of words, they're not typical. Because when we're looking at communication, we're looking at functional skills. Are they able to communicate their basic wants and needs? Are they understanding what things are? Do they know their favorite toy? Do they show preference for things? Because those are the kinds of things that we're doing from six to 12 months. So we've talked to our baby. We've shown them these toys. We've introduced all these words and all these different sounds. And now they're six to 12 months. And we are going to be showing them a ball and a truck. Which one do you want? We're going to be letting them make those choices to see if they should have those preferences. We're going to let them explore those toys from six to 12 months. What's the six or 12, six to 12 month old going to do with a little holy ball? They're going to hold it. They're going to look at it and they're going to move it from hand to hand. Are they moving it from hand to hand? Are you seeing any, anything that looks out of the ordinary? Um, they're going to take that truck. They may look at it. They may be able to. Um, they probably not at six months, they're not going to be able to push buttons to make noises and make the music and the, the sounds go. But those are the kinds of toys that you're going to have. Once they've explored them and they've seen them and we get to that 12 month stage, 
that's when we're really going to get into the meat of what we're doing with language because some 12 months old, 12 month old babies have single words. They're imitating, they're doing those things. But from six to 12 months, that's where we're really going to hit really, really hard that motor imitation piece. It is a prerequisite skill that I've seen so many kids have skipped over because the, a lot of times parents don't know that motor imitation is a prerequisite for verbal imitation. And when they get 12 to 18 months old and we want them to imitate words and imitate sounds, if they can't imitate with their body what we're doing, we can't really expect them to imitate with their voice what we're asking them to do. And it's very, it can be very intimidating. But learning to talk, learning to communicate should not be traumatic for children. And that's when we do it through play. So we're 12 months and we're starting to explore toys on our own, probably walking by now. So now your world is like full go, full blown. We're into everything. We're exploring. We're looking in cabinets. We're going from one thing to the next because that's how kids learn. They explore. But it's also very important that they can do with these toys and play with these toys appropriately. Um, they're going to have preferences. They're going to have their favorite teddy bear. They're going to have their favorite truck. They may have a favorite block that they like. But are they doing with these toys what we want them to do? And what I mean by that is, are they rolling a car back and forth? Are they able to start stacking some blocks on top of one another? So what you see is we're working on some fine motor, but we're also working on cognitive. We're developing that language through motor play. Because when they're rolling that car, we're not going to sit there as the parent or as the speech therapist and just watch them and be like, oh, look, it's so nice. They're playing with that car. We're going to be saying things like, look, you're rolling the car. The car is going fast. You have a big red truck. We're not going to sit there and say, oh, look, it's a block. We're watching them stack blocks. We're going to talk about putting those blocks in and taking those blocks out. We're going to show them what we want them to do. Another big thing that I talk to my parents about is telling them, showing them, and helping them. Kids are not going to know what to say if we don't tell them. They're not going to know what they're doing if we don't tell them. They're not going to know what to do with that truck. They're not going to know what to do with those blocks if we don't tell them and then show them. So you see, now that show piece comes into that we we're starting to bring that motor imitation piece in. Then we're going to help them. I have so many parents that tell me all the time, I, I don't help them do something. So the toy that comes to mind is the little pop-up toy with the little buttons that you push a button and something pops up and then you slide a little slide over and then something pops up and then you turn a dial and something pops up. And I can never remember what the fourth one is. I, maybe it's another push button. I don't know. But anyway, everyone knows, everyone can picture the toy that I'm talking about, right? So we're going to tell them, you're pushing. You're going to push. You have to push the button. And that's the first prompt we're going to get. Push the button. And we're going to wait. Which leads me into something else that I need to talk about that I'm really big on. And it's back in the day. It was called the extended, it was called the environmental control prompt hierarchy. Now we just call it extended wait time because it's our natural in inclination to say, look, push the button, push it, push the button, push it, push the button. And then we say it over and over and over and over again. When we do that with a child that's 12 to 18 months old, we're bombarding them with auditory input and their little brains don't have time to process what it is that we've asked them to do. They don't know push. They may not know push yet. So how are we going to teach them push? We're going to tell them, push the button. And we're going to wait. Quietly. And that was about a three second pause, right? It was very uncomfortable. I can see Katie here. She's smiling. Because it's, it's uncomfortable. We think that we have to fill this space with words all the time. If you think about it, it's kind of like typing on a computer really, really fast. It sometimes takes a little minute, a little bit to catch up. 
kids' brains do not process at the same speed that we can process things. So when I tell a child, push a button, I'm going to wait and see what they do and see how long it takes them to process. Well, they want me to do something with this button, but I'm not sure. So if they don't do it, then what do you do? You show them. We've told them what to do. Now we're going to show him. So then I am going to push that button and the little thing is going to pop up and he's going to be like, whoa, that's awesome. And then I'm going to close it and I'm going to tell him again, push the button and I'm going to wait. If he doesn't do it at that point, I've told him what to do. I've shown him what to do. Now I'm going to help him. So many times that hand over hand assistance is skipped over. And I'm not really sure why, because when we're doing wheels on the bus, how many times are you doing wheels on the bus? Just you. Everybody takes the kids' hands and they go, wheels on the bus go round and round. That's what we do. We're going to do it. We're going to take his hands. We're going to help that child do it, right? We're we're playing peekaboo. You take that kid's hands and you put them over his face and then you pull them back. Motor memory, motor imitation. I'm going to show him. I'm going to help him. And then I'm going to, and then I'm going to help him do it after I show him, right? And by doing that, that's where we develop that motor memory. But also if he can get it after that second show him, after I've told him and I've shown him, what is that? That is motor imitation. He knew to take his little hand and do exactly what I did with that toy. So now we're building on that motor imitation skill, right? It all goes hand in hand with play. We're going to do that with blocks. When you're teaching a child to put the shapes in the shape sorter, we're not just going to go, here you go. Good luck with that. Let me know how that works out for you. We're going to talk about that language that goes with that activity. And I, I talked to my parents about not getting overwhelmed because I remember when my daughter was little, um, Her dad came home from work one day and I had taught her to do something simple, like maybe take her shoe off or put her shoe on something. And he got this panicked look on his face and he goes, oh my God, there's so much that we have to teach her. (laughs) And I was like, then I got panicked. I was like, oh crap, there is a lot we've got to teach her. We've got to teach her to talk. We've got to teach her to dress herself and brush her teeth and take care of herself and be safe and all the things. So don't get overwhelmed. And also don't go out and buy every educational cognitive based toy that there is. You can do motor play with a wooden spoon and a plastic tub from your kitchen sink. You don't have to have all of the fancy light up, making all the noise toys. You just don't. You can take the blocks and put them in a bucket. But what's most important is that we're remembering what language goes with this activity. If you're playing with trucks and cars and you're rolling cars back and forth, we're going to talk about going fast. We're going to talk about moving. We're going to talk about those early developing prepositions. Yes, even at 12 to 18 months, we're going to be doing that. Because if we're not introducing that language in these activities, how can we expect them to learn it? We're going to also focus on that receptive piece. And this is where a lot of parents that I have found, and as speech pathologists, these are things that we know. These are, you know, they're drilled into us when we're in school and we know them. We understand the difference between expressive and receptive language. Expressive language meaning this is how I'm communicating, whether it's a point, whether it's a sign, whether it's a word. Receptive language is what do they understand? So going back to that six to 12 month age, and when we're showing those toys and we're giving them choices, we're seeing if they have those preferences, we're going to have a ball in a truck and we're going to say, let's play with the ball. And we're going to show them their toys and we're going to see, do they know what a ball is when they hear that word? Because again, that receptive language, if they don't understand when you say the word ball, that this is a ball or this is a truck or this is mom and this is dad, then we can't expect them to say those words. If they're not in their bank, if you will, if they're not in that receptive memory, we're not going to be able to expect them to be able to say those words. So we're building those receptive skills early on 
even at that six to 12 month age range. When we get to 12 to 18 months and they are moving and they're mobile, I I tell parents all the time, sometimes we have to set the environment up so that they can communicate, right? And what I mean by that, as speech pathologists, we know this, but I'm really hoping that this podcast can reach new moms and reach those people who don't have that background in language development and that it, this can be helpful for them. So using those um, those created moments to teach that language. So I tell parents all the time, put a ball in a truck, a ball in a book, a book in a shoe on the couch. There's not a lot of distractions. Um, and ask that child who's mobile, because now we're 12 to 18 months, bring mommy the book and wait that extended wait time. Um, we've told them, all right? We've told them what we want. We wait. If they don't respond, next we're going to do what? We're going to show them. I may point to the book. I may walk closer to the book. I'm going to get in a closer proximity so that they understand I want the book. I may gesture. So now I've told them and I've shown them, I want the book and I'm going to hold my hand out because just intrinsically when you hold your hand out, People typically take something or they give you something, even as adults. If they don't do it after we've told them and we've shown them, we're going to help them. Following through and helping those kids complete that task that you've asked them to do is vitally important because it teaches that motor memory. If you've asked them to give, give mommy the book and they don't, and then you don't help them complete that, then they don't understand give mommy the book means put something in her hand. Now, if they give you something different, that's okay too. We're going we're gonna to name it. We're going to talk about it. And then we're going to say, that's the truck. I want the book. And then when you do that and you point to it and you give those gestures and you show him, then he's going to be able to understand. But you're also developing that receptive language during play. Okay. So I think we've gotten through birth to 18 months. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. And I know that it was very general. I know it was pretty broad because, again, I could have sat here for three hours and gone through every single stage. So for me to be able to put this into a 15 to 20 minute podcast that was very, very difficult for me to do. Um, when they told me, you've got 15 minutes, let's try to get it done. I was like, whoo. And my mind has just been racing because I could talk about it for hours. So I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. I hope that what you can take away from this is that language development starts at birth. And that really all we have to do is talk to our babies. We have to show our babies things and we have to help them do those things so that we can develop that language when they get to that 18 month stage. Um, hopefully we're getting into some of those words and we're getting into those early developing sounds and imitating non-speech things, which is something that we're going to talk about in our next episode. So thank you for joining us today and um, tune in next time when we start talking a little bit more in depth about 18 to 36 months of age. Thanks so much. Thank you for tuning in to SLP Full Disclosure. You can learn more about this episode and our show on our website at amnhealthcare.com. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend and subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform. You can also find show updates and SLP opportunities on our Instagram at amnallied. Special thanks to AMN Healthcare for making this show possible. See y'all next time.